I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Colin Rouse. I'm from the University of Kansas, and I've kind of a last minute volunteer to introduce Luke since it, no one was assigned to do that. Uh, it was a tremendous privilege, though, because Luke Helker is actually one of my former advisees. He graduated from the University of Kansas this past spring. Uh, while he was there, along the way, he got a master's uh, of music in musicology, a master of music in percussion, and a doctor of musical arts in percussion. He's a tremendously diverse scholar, thinker, and musician in a lot of ways. Since graduating and while he was finishing up, he uh, has taken on a, a position teaching a variety of courses and percussion lessons at Benedictine College in Northeast Kansas, as well as creating a middle school music program at one of the private high schools in Lawrence, Kansas, and a variety of other teaching and performing on the side as well. So with that, Luke Helker with a lecture recital on materials that matter, cultivating a musical tradition with found objects.
just make sure everything is set. All right. Thank you all for being here with me today. I understand there are a lot of other presentations taking place, uh, opportunities to reconnect with friends and colleagues, or frankly, just the chance to take a nap and provide some sort of respite from all the overstimulation that takes place at a conference like this. So again, I thank you all for being here today. I'd also like to extend uh, a very heartfelt thanks to the board, staff, everyone at AMS, SMT for putting on uh, such a, a truly wonderful and awe-inspiring conference. Um, in addition to the hotel staff for being so accommodating, it's not every day that they get people calling up asking them to store some blocks of ice. So thank you to everyone involved in, in this presentation. You just heard uh, Breath Contained by Tonya Ko. And the title of this work is, in a sense, a thesis statement for uh, today's talk. As Co states, the goal of this and other similar works involving bubble wrap uh, are aimed to, quote, release the voice of this mundane object. It is my hope that this lecture recital will reveal to you all the many voices contained within the objects that you see and hear on stage. Admittedly, though, it does seem rather embarrassing to be presenting such a topic among such an enviable cohort of some of our field's brightest minds. I've already seen several truly compelling and thought-provoking presentations, and I hope that this presentation will provide some modicum of insight for you to take home with you. But I confess, too, that you are also witnessing a research project that is still in its infant stages. Uh, as Dr. Rouse pointed out, I just graduated from the University of Kansas in May, and so the first time that this presentation was, was presented um, was about six months ago. Um, and so as I continue to interrogate my argument and expand my research, I hope that presenting this uh, on such a stage as this will provide uh, an opportunity for additional feedback and reflection, and there'll be uh, plenty of time afterwards for a Q&A should, uh, should people feel the need to exchange in, in this dialogue. Now, on to the subject of found objects or junk percussion, or household objects, or any number of other terms that are uh, dispensed interchangeably by composers and performers alike. This became the first obstacle, and indeed one of the driving forces behind this research. Since percussionists, ha uh, since percussionists have adopted many of these objects in their own instrumentarium, it seemed somewhat prudent to at least attempt to establish uh, a more cohesive vernacular around these objects and the manner in which they are employed throughout the repertoire. Percussionists very often reference Stephen Schick's refrain on the German word for sh percussion being Schlagzeug, which uh, translates to strike stuff. But it is precisely the word stuff that I want to drill down on today. And to do that, I turn to someone who is not a percussionist, not a theorist, or a musicologist, but rather an anthropologist. Daniel Miller is an anthropologist whose main focus is on the study of stuff, or in other words, material cultures and materiality. He's written books on consumption, social media, and the aptly titled 2009 book, Stuff. In the introduction of this book, he proposes a definition for anthropology, which is someone who, excuse me, someone who seeks to demonstrate the consequences of the universal for the particular, and of the particular for the universal by equal devotion to the empathic understanding and encompassment of both. With this book, he demonstrates how clothing and home ownership, among other th examples, provide a better understanding of the nature of anthropology and human behavior. I bring this up because it is my goal to better understand the universality of being a percussionist through the particularness of these found objects. Looking at my art through the lens of anthropology has given me a fresh perspective on what we do. For starters, I've come to realize something that I've known deep down, but hadn't quite yet been able to articulate, which is that to me, nearly all of the items that fall under the banner of percussion, traditional and non-traditional alike, are, can almost all be considered found objects. These instruments have been discovered from other cultures around the world, and integrated uh, and appro appropriated into the Western canon through many forms of global connection and exchange, obviously some being far more heinous than others. 
The rate at which we've acquired these instruments and incorporated them into our conventional ensembles has happened so quickly and dramatically, seemingly without much regard for their heritage. And as a result, most collegiate level percussionists are blessed with having shelves replete with a dazzling array of shakers, gongs, and bells. However, the flip side of this though is that with all of this at their disposal, the tendency is for students to simply grab whatever is within arm's reach. But what if we pause for a moment, just before we pick up that gong, and ask ourselves, is this the most appropriate object or instrument for this musical uh, example? Or are we guilty of succumbing to Maslow's law, perhaps uncoincidentally titled, the law of the instrument, which states, if the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. We must remember that the nail in this analogy still has an origin story, as does the hammer. And while the hammer and the nail may be rather mundane in our literal sense, gongs and rattles are not. They are foundational components to ancient rituals and ceremonies performed by people whose names we will never know. This has led me to a fundamental question behind this project. What is the difference between an instrument and an object? Well, I'm kind of biased. I've tipped my hand a little on this. So if, if, if my answer isn't sort of obvious, then I don't know, I don't know what else I can say. Um, but let's, let's try and illustrate this more con concretely. Let us turn to the brake drum, this object right here. Let's turn to the brake drum as an example. The brake drum, excuse me, the brake drum has been found in many, many musical environments. It's been a substitute for an anvil sound in a lot of 20th century repertoire like Aaron Copland's John Henry. Uh, it has been featured in many of the early ensemble works for percussion by Lou Harrison, John Cage, and Henry Cowell, to name a few. But it can also be found in the engine room of a steel band. It is a propulsive rhythmic and sonic voice that anchors an ensemble that is, not coincidentally, also fashioned out of repurposed materials. Does this mean then that the brake drum has graduated from objecthood and can now be included in the lofty confines of a percussive instrumentarium? I don't think so, but I'm also no longer sure that that was the right question to be asking in the first place. Because framing it in such a way reinforces a hierarchy where instruments like the timpani and the marimba reside up here, where tin cans and brake drums reside down here. And I'm not sure percussionists actually want to live in a world where that is the case. Removing this type of hierarchy excuse me, quickly calls to mind the ready-made works of Marcel Duchamp, who insisted that putting a urinal in an art gallery vaulted its status to new artistic heights. And indeed, it is a fitting comparison. But lately, I'm drawn to making comparisons between these works and the works, the sculptures of Klaus Oldenburg whose sculptures embody the true spirit and scale of what I want to convey with these pieces. To amplify or enlarge them reveals the minute textures, hidden shapes, and indeed the breath contained within each structure. Another compelling feature of these sculptures is also where they happen to be placed. Take the shuttlecocks scattered through the front lawn of the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City. These are public facing works and therefore accessible to anyone without having to enter the museum itself. The same cannot be said for the works of Duchamp. This allows these works to take on new significance and become symbols for a city and its values. The shuttlecocks are for Kansas City, perhaps as the bean represent, what the bean represents for Chicago or the love sculpture in Philadelphia. Again, the, coming back to this idea of the particular for the universal and the universal for the particular. And so now that I've provided at least some degree of philosophical motivation for this project, uh, I'd like to share something that's a little more tangible and concrete. So I've been attempting to establish a model to assist in determining how we can uh, catalog these pieces, uh, these objects, knowing that in any given musical uh, situation, the context is likely to change. Originally, I had identified two intersecting spectra one of which, which concerns materiality, going from raw to artificial, and the other dealt with 
this idea of transformation or to the degree in which an object is transformed during the performance. However, I soon realized that this language was perhaps both too broad and also too subjective. And it forced me to employ more poetic interpretations of what it meant to transform an object in a piece when I was short of any literal transformation. And after all, do we not already transform an object by repurposing it for a musical aim? So I've modified the language around here to what I, I believe and what I hope is a more objective stance towards the physical and sonic properties of any given object and how that may or may not change through the course of a given piece. I've retained the two uh, spectra, one for materials and one for the sonic properties. But on each end of the spectrum, we go from minimal manipulation to maximal manipulation. And I'll sort of explain a little more what I mean through the context of, of each piece. And here is what these two spectra look like when they uh, uh, intersect with one another. And the result then is four sort of overlapping categories here. The, uh, we have from clockwise going from left to right, we have minimal manipulation of material and sound, minimal manipulation of material, maximum manipulation of sound, maximum manipulation of material and sound, and finally, maximum manipulation of material, minimum manipulation of sound. It's a bit wordy, I know, but, but and admittedly, it's still, it's not quite an ironclad model. But nevertheless, a model like this provides a malleable visual representation for the way these objects are dispersed throughout the pieces. And so what you see here is the same grid with several plots on it. Each of these plots represents one of the pieces that you'll hear today. Since most of the pieces focus around uh, a singular object, or at least you know, multiple objects from the same family, uh, I've placed singular dots to reflect this. However, in the case of Mark Applebaum's piece that you'll hear later, it would be more beneficial to carry out this same exercise where every object instead of piece is given its own dot, its own representation on the graph. This strategy, too, extends to when uh, found objects are found in chamber music or large ensemble, uh, large ensemble pieces as well. So this is just simply sort of a, a snapshot. But what I do like about this model is the degree of flexibility it offers to whoever is using it. Even when trying to look at everything through an objective lens, these coordinates were determined by me and my, my own interpretations of the pieces. And any one of you could have the same chart, the same instruments, and, and still plot your, your, your points, your objects, in slightly different um, uh, locations on the graph. And it helps. You, know, it, you can only really do that once you, as the performer, develop a relationship with the character and the music of these objects. And so with that, I'd like to segue into the, the first quadrant, which contains pieces for uh, minimal manipulation of both sonic and material properties. And the piece that I've chosen to represent this is John Cage's Child of Tree. John Cage has already sort of uh, initiated this idea of, you know, found objects being welcome in the concert hall. We all know uh, his, his stance on all sounds created equal and so on and so forth. Um, and it's his 1940 living room music that I cite as, as w at least one of the, the first examples of a piece that's written for all non-conventional uh, objects, which he lists as household objects, things like uh, a door, uh, a door frame or a table, and so on and so forth. But in the case of Child of Tree, there was a, there's been a question that's been percolating in my mind for a while now, which is, in, in, 20, in 2023, can anyone really perform Child of Tree without invoking some sort of human impact on the environment? The reason why this was stuck in my head was that I've performed works in the past that contain rather overt references to human interference with the natural world. But this piece was composed well before our current understanding of the, of the climate crisis. And so, but at what cost then? You know, if we're taking these objects out of their natural environment and putting them into the concert hall, I'm not sure what that, what that says about, about um, 
being able to admire the sounds on their own terms when taken out of that context. The score for A Child of Tree consists of a series of written or perhaps more accurately scribbled instructions. The list of materials are, which you see here in front of me, the list of materials um, are collected based on their relationship to plants and nature. With exception of the cactus and the seed pod rattle, uh, the performer is free to pick and choose the remaining items. You'll see here that I have some bamboo chimes, some pine cones, twigs, leaves, uh, and, and some rocks as well. The performer is then instructed to use the I Ching to determine certain parameters of the piece. Cage limits the duration of this piece to eight minutes, but then relies on the I Ching to help determine other aspects of the piece, such as you know, subsections within that eight minutes and the number of materials you are allowed to include within each of those subsections. And so while we're on the subject, let us also note how the I Ching, a Chinese text on divination, has also been removed from its original context and repurposed as one of the primary tools for uh, developing ch cages chance procedures. So because of this, I decided to just use a random number generator to establish the necessary parameters for my own performance. Once this has been completed, then the piece itself is really just a structured improvisation, not unlike uh, Ton Tonya Coe's piece as well. And so the reason for including it in this uh, minimal manipulation category is that Cage does never uh, instruct the performer to destroy or, or uh, manipulate an object in any, in any dramatic fashion. I certainly could choose to do so by snapping a twig or uh, crumbling a leaf into dust, and doing so would certainly reposition uh, its placement on, on the graph that we saw earlier. You'll notice too that the cactus is, is amplified. The amplification is not intended to further distort the sounds through any other electronic means, rather it's simply uh, a logistical consideration for audiences to be able to hear throughout. And so with that, I'd like to perform for you all now Child of Tree.
Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to turn now towards the opposite corner, which would be maximum manipulation of both sonic and material properties. Interestingly enough, this piece is also centered around a naturally recurring material, that of ice. I know everyone's like, oh, there's ice on the table. What's it going to be? What's it going to sound like? Here we go. So this piece is Vivian Fung's The Ice is Talking, written in 2017 for uh, Stephen Schick and Ayun Huang. This piece begins with knives seductively performing figure eights across the blocks of ice as a callback to the composer's youth when she would skate across the frozen ponds in Canada. Throughout the piece, these knives continue to tap and glide their way around the ice, walking a literal knife's edge between the graceful gestures of an ice skater and the capacity for violence that these knives can exert. And indeed, as the piece goes on, my gestures will become increasingly more violent. All of this occurs while the ice is melting in real time, and has been, um, with the human hand accelerating the process. This, of course, continues, or excuse me, continues to change the tone of the ice, which I hope will be apparent through the amplification. And there is some additional electronic mediation uh, provided by a max patch, uh, though to me it is a little more of an undercurrent, more of a soundscape, and the, the majority of what you'll hear is coming from the amplified ice. It is perhaps cliche a little bit at this point to suggest that the natural world has a voice or language of its own. We already know that it does, and many people have devoted large portions of their lives to better understanding it. And so I'll dispense with any attempt to, to mobilize or marshal uh, attention towards this idea uh, and let the ice speak for itself. This is Vivian Fung's The Ice is Talking. Make sure the pedal works.
Thank you. Uh, thanks for sticking with me. There's a lot going on with this. Um, so the next category is minimal manipulation of the material and maximum manipulation of the sound properties, in which I've positioned both Tonya Coe's piece that you heard earlier and the next piece we'll hear, which is Matthew Bertner's Broken Drum. Some final thoughts on, on Coe's piece, since I didn't talk about it that much at the beginning. My actions as the performer are not particularly novel, at least not for a percussionist. I tap, sweep, and flutter finger my way across the terrain while, um, uh, with, with some of the amplification to you know, reveal some of those textures. And just as a, this is a stupid story, but I'll tell it anyway. As a quick aside, I pref I'd sort of test drove some of these pieces with my middle school students just to see how well it would go off with the general audience. But I had a sixth grader who was, who was quite astute and um, identified that I was sort of attempting at, at some moments to perform the bubble wrap in a way a pianist might approach playing the keys. Uh, it was not something I had, had indicated, but it was certainly something I thought. And the fact that she had able been, she'd been that receptive, I found pretty remarkable. So kids these days. Um, 
But the actions that I, I create in this piece, uh, they create a central tension, which, is what, which I think is what I don't do in that piece, which is pop the bubbles, at least not until the very end, uh, which I guess, I don't know, is that a perfect authentic cadence? I don't know. Um, some theorists here could, 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 would be better appropriate to answer that question. Um, and I don't know about you, but you know, when, when, when I was a child, whenever there was bubble wrap in the house, um, we would immediately dance and stomp on it until it, was, until it had all been deflated and then discard it. So instead of, uh, so I tap instead of stomp and create a different type of dance, one that I think is as uh, gentle and as protective as the material itself. So turning to Bertner's piece, this piece with the break drum, and I'll, I'll give you a forewarning that it's probably the loudest piece. Um, in this piece, I am encouraged to use and explore the unique properties of every surface of the, of the, of the object. The bulk of the piece is centered around a tremolo in the middle opening of the drum, with the placement of my hand to both mute and unmute the sound in a rhythmic fashion. There is a pre-recorded pre tape that I play along with, and the pre-recorded tape is derived uh, using granular synthesis that further explores and distorts every audible facet of, of a break drum. That it is playing alongside me is, is only to create the mere illusion that we are in an active dialogue. And I suppose this in tandem with the constant muting or suppressing of the object's voice might suggest some larger theme on you know, our, our dialogues or perhaps lack thereof between uh, industry and nature. Perhaps maybe you know, the rise of electronic vehicles will render objects like brake drums obsolete and force us to find other materials to replace them. It's happened before, after all. The brake drums of the 30s and 40s that were so readily available to cage and cowl uh, are far, far more resonant than the brake drums that we use today. And so I, I, don't, I won't speak for Matthew, but I, I look forward and welcome the opportunity to move beyond the break drum and to modify the conversation with, with the evolution of new objects as they exist in their own uh, context and seeing how we can then find new creative ways for repurposing them in a musical sense. But for now, I hope you'll enjoy Matthew Bertner's Broken Drum.
We'll conclude with our final category, that of minimal manipulation of sound, maximum manipulation of the materials. And the piece that I've chosen to represent this is Mark Applebaum's 2006 piece, Echolalia. Echolalia contains what Applebaum calls 22 Dadaist rituals, though to my knowledge, the actions performed as a part of this piece are not uh, directly contained with any pre-existing Dada literature. Nevertheless, the absurdity that defined the Dada movement is on full display here. As uh, Applebaum states in the score, these, quote, these gestures should look familiar, though uh, as if it were some sort of musical convention of an alien species. And there are four principal actions governing this piece. One, combining or attaching, mixing or syncretizing, separating or atomizing, and the last, treating or deforming. But the sonic palette itself is still generated by interacting with these objects in a relatively normal, mundane fashion, at least on their own individual terms. For example, in just a moment, you'll see me interact with a typewriter, some duct tape, a can of spray paint, in a relatively ordinary fashion. The sounds that are generated are not particularly unusual, but as you'll see, the sounds are incidental to the acts of vandalism and destruction that will occur. I have a few final remarks before uh, concluding with this piece, and I'd like to just briefly return to Daniel Miller and his, and his def working definition of, of anthropology, which is, someone who seeks to demonstrate the consequences of the universal for the particular and of the particular for the universal by equal devotion to the empathic understanding and encompassment of both. As I continue to develop my artistic and educational practice, I do so with equal devotion, as highlighted here, to objects and the more traditional instruments in the percussion inventory. I am choosing to, as Stephen Schick suggests, strip away the aristocracy that comes from separating or perhaps overvaluing instruments over objects. With this new perspective, a drum becomes not just a drum, but a container of air. A triangle, simply a bent piece of metal, no more or less sophisticated than a brake drum. This, to me, is the universality of being a percussionist. Here is Echolalia by Mark Applebaum.
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a couple questions. Uh, I guess both the uh, the Vivian Fung piece and probably um, who's the other one? Uh, hey, the brain trauma. Yeah. Did computer or was any of that pre-recorded or was it like I? Some of it sounded like it could have been supplied to you ahead, but some of it seemed like it was interacting with you in real time. So I'm just curious, and there might be different answer for both those pieces. Yeah. So. The question is the, the tape parts, the backing tracks for both uh, Matthew Bertner's Broken Drum, which was the break drum piece that I played, and Vivian Fung's The Ice Is Talking. Um, for Bertner, they were two separate things. I'm reading with, um, I can show you this. You're more than welcome to see the, the score. Some of the notation is traditional. Some of it is very much not traditional. Um, but in the case of Matthew Bertner's score, he, he supplies you know, the rhythms and then an approximate waveform of what the tape is doing so that you can sort of align yourself in some way. But there, it's not, um, not time-stamped in any way. OK, because on that one, which was different than the video, the, the, there were a lot of interesting polyrhythms that yes. were taking place. And I didn't know if that was an interesting result or if he really, if you had to be so exact to conform with that. Like, that was just a, a clever coincidence. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then uh, with, with Fung's piece, so if, uh, Vivian Fung is using a, a max patch, and the signal that's coming in from the microphones is providing some uh, additional um, reverb. But again, that's another situation where it is separate from a backing track. And so there were, you, you probably heard some of those extra voices and everything. All of that had been pre-programmed. I, I did speak as well, but then there were other moments where I wasn't speaking, but there were still some voices in the track. Places where I was hearing voices, it sounded like the exact timbre of your voice, which was what made me think that I had processed your voice. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Okay. No, uh, that's interesting. No, uh, that, that you heard that. No, I wasn't, and I, at least I wasn't consciously trying to mimic okay. the voice in the tape either. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Thank you. Any others? Yeah, do you want to use the mic or? I can, I can project. All right. Um, so I've been to way too many percussion recitals in my life. Um, you make it seem like that's a bad thing. And, no, 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 no. I, never enough, actually, I'll say. Thank um, you. And, and like, I was thinking, like, to watch Ayun play is to watch a dancer. Yes. And especially thinking about your questions today and watching you play, like, the difference between an object and an instrument is a percussionist. Right? None of these things are making sound right now. Mm -hmm. you, you are actually what makes them into instruments. Yeah. And so I guess I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts on the instrumentality of self and kind of the implications of embodied sound in relation to your project. It's a great question. Um, <laughs> it, it, it is indeed something that I think about a lot. And as you so astutely and correctly pointed out, none of these objects make a sound until until I uh, command it to, which then perhaps speaks to a certain degree of, of autonomy that the, the instruments have, or excuse me, that the objects have, but um, that is not what your question is asking. It's just something I, I thought of at the moment. Um, it's, to, to be totally honest, it's not something I've thought too deeply about other than just the sort of the surface level um, I'm, and responsible for making the sound and shaping the sound, um, both based on what is prescribed in, in the score and my own sort of artistic intention. Um, did that answer your question? Not entirely, so I apologize. I'd have to think about that more, more deeply, yeah. But I'll think about it some more, and maybe I can come back to it. Um, I have a question also. Uh, um, thank you very much for all your effort and this fascinating paper. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm studying musical instruments. So and I was seeing your paper as an organology paper, actually. And um, and thinking about where is the difference between, between the object and the instrument. Yeah. Um, in my studies, I try to 
to consider like classic musical instruments, mm -hmm. Western musical instruments as objects, yeah. and as objects that have like a function in society and that have maybe more this kind of uh, yeah function that a nail or a hammer or a screwdriver also might have, but in a different context, in a musical context, but also in society and so on. So um, I think there's the distinction between the object and the in instrument is, is just like a scholarly distinction or so. So I would like to invite you to our organology study group. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and contribute with your ideas because I think it's very interesting because um, yeah, we have to 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 see it from from yeah the other way around, you know, from the object perspective, and this I found very fascinating that you came from this side. Yeah. Thank you for for your remarks. I uh, totally agree with everything that you said, and yeah, the the socks and horn bossel bossel. Um, a lot of that organology literature was was you know part of the um, you know the was part of the you know the the survey of the research literature and using that, but also in surveying um, percussive textbooks, how they take some of that and you know, modify some of that within the the sort of a narrower scope. Uh, all of that was contributing to to my research. But you're also correct to point out that there's there's a a, a hint of this being more or less just a sort of. Uh, Academic exercise, just an academic mental mental exercise, which I I, uh, I embrace. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Question. Yeah. So this question is going to be kind of a short and technical question, but I first want to thank you for providing to us such a sonically rich and thought-provoking presentation, and I, I feel like this is such a wonderful opportunity because in in academia, we really we don't study music like this often. Maybe a footnote in the music history sequence about uh, John Cage, but that's that's mainly it. So, w with that question, speaking of Cage, I wanted to know how, when you were uh, performing with the two stones together, how you were able to manipulate the pitch so, such that it was higher and lower. Yes. So. First of all, uh, thank you for your comments. I appreciate the I appreciate the the kindness, um, and uh, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying too about the perhaps the the limitations of, of maybe discussing this in an academic context. I feel like most of us maybe bring up uh, Cage's Water Walk, that you know that video performance, but it ends up more so being a conversation around does this qualify as music. Right. And perhaps less so about um, the the instrumentation itself and the musical qualities that that come from that. Um, but to, to answer your question with the stones, this is a trick that I I learned while doing um, uh, George Crumb's music for a summer evening. Um. Uh, in the fourth movement, he he calls for prayer stones, but he organizes it in either ascending or descending melodies. So if you're in a pinch and you don't have five prayer stones at your disposal, what you can do is you can squeeze the stone itself and then open up your hand. And by doing that, you can kind of modulate the, the pitch, so to speak. And so that's what I was doing. I was simply just uh, uh, loosening or tightening my grip on, on the rock while I was doing that. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Of course, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, these performances are really, um, really engaging. Um, I'm also in the organology group, so we'll be able to connect. Um, but I, I had a question about the instruments and how uh, kind of your processes in like choosing these objects, because there are so many just objects in our world today to choose from. So when you're looking for um, like specific objects to perform with, I'm just wondering to what extent do you kind of like experiment with the objects before? Like, are you looking for a certain thickness of paper? Are you looking for like a certain um, resonance of the joke that you choose? Uh, or maybe it's more kind of technical, like how, how, how the objects work for your purpose? 
the, the answer is honestly a little a bit of column A, column B, depending on the piece. A lot of what um, guided the, the selection you see today is because it's all from the solar repertoire and for the most part reasonably logistically feasible. Not really. Um, but, <laughs> you know, another thing I'll say about um, some of these pieces is in the case of Echolalia, because you are constantly destroying and breaking everything, you have to rebuy a lot of a lot of these items, and so I'll be honest. Some of it uh, it comes down to like a financial um, motive, where it's like I can't afford always. So when I can, I certainly do, but I can't always afford you know the best type of paper or the most resonant sounding um, drill. But that's more that's more so. Uh, an answer to, 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 to that piece. I'm certainly thinking about that a lot with maybe the selection of the cactus. This one has, you know, really larger um, bristles compared to other cacti, um, uh, the, the resonance of the rocks, things of that nature. The ice is, you know, certainly a battle between, um, between time and, and what I can do with it. Uh, um, I think if there are other ones. Break drums too. Break drums, if, if they're painted, it, it modifies the timbre a little bit. Um, and so I don't want to go. And then same too with the with the, the bubble wrap, three different you know sizes of, of bubbles to get three different sort of textures. Um, so it, it is definitely something I'm conscious of. Th there is a, um, I'm, I'm borrowing this, this phrase, but I love it so much and I wish I had thought of it. Um, when it comes to found objects, it was, I, I read it in Jess Sang's paper, but uh, I think she attributes it to um, uh, Josh, blanking on his name from So Percussion, um, and is that these objects are uh, um, very curatable, but yet easily disposable. And I think that is maybe like a, a, a thumbnail sketch of what I'm, of how I'm approaching some of these pieces. I was wondering um, how all of your work here with um, studying um, found objects and all of the categorization that you've done, um, how that's transferred back to playing more traditional, typical percussion instruments, um, and if it's affected your um, teaching as well. Certainly has affected my teaching. Um, although with with my students, we haven't really played any of this literature yet, much, <laughs> much, much to my chagrin. Um, it, on the one hand, it's it's it. It asks I, this research has really asked me to consider, you know, um, when it is and isn't appropriate to use certain types of like tie gongs. Um, and are there ways of finding like another substitute for that timbre from a less um, culturally significant object? Um, but as I as I said in my concluding remarks, you know, I think of the 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 triangle just a, a bent piece of metal. I, I I guess the the real answer to your question is I'm sort of privileging the instruments less, the the more traditional instruments like bass drum and, and, and timpani and, and something like that. I don't necessarily say that to my students right away because I don't want to you know um, encourage any sort of lackadaisical behavior. But but when we're ready to start having some of these argue, maybe more big brain conversations, um, then then that's that's when I start to to encourage that from them. But but at the end of the day, it it also comes down to um, sound quality that can be both objective and subjective, and encouraging the the students and myself to find our own musical voice um, through the process of, of of learning these works or any work. I mean, I, I really. This is a late night conversation that could go on for, for hours and hours, but I really, I don't see that much of a difference between um, the ice is talking and uh, like a rudimental snare piece. Um, yeah. How, wait, hold on, sorry, or how are we doing on time? I don't wanna make sure, okay, we've got time. Yes, in the back. Uh, yeah, this is perfect. I was just gonna say, it looked like a lot of what you were doing on the, on the piece on the ice is more or less snare technique very often. Um, and so I was sort of 
curious to hear you uh, to hear how you're thinking about how technique specifically, like if you're asked to do something like more traditional like that, where you're not in the cage, if you're thinking of that on your uh, you know, cartoon plane of like is that like manipulating the sound more because it's sort of not different technique, yeah. yeah. It's like a technique, you know, it's artificial technique, but it's like a man made technique that's the short answer is yes, it's absolutely something I am uh, considering. It starts as sort of like what's a, a sort of generic uh, acceptable baseline knowledge of what most percussionists know and learn and, and study and what they're asked to do. And then how, how is that modified through the piece? In the example of, of the ice piece, um, I'm, I'm constantly asked to sort of change the placement of the, the tip of the blade or the flat part of the blade um, on the ice to produce different different um, techniques. And so it's sort of, I, I, I'm still thinking about it in terms of maybe like the small muscle groups like double stroke rolls and, and, and stuff like that, um, especially also with like the bamboo and, and the larger muscle groups. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> yes. Sorry, I'm realizing now I'm not great at answering these questions. <laughs> Lauren, it's great to see you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, wonderful job. Thank um, you. I was wondering, I might have missed it because I just like the first part, but mm -hmm. like, what um, are you kind of constituting as a found object for the purpose of this um, project? Uh, the, the one that really stands out to me is the break drum, um, just because like in some contexts it's, it's more widely accepted as an instrument. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking like specifically of kind of like steel band. Obviously, like it's it's pretty much a staple within like you know the engine room. Um, and then also on that note, uh, would would steel pan be a found object in your I, yeah, steel pan is, is almost is certainly a found object. Um, so I did actually reference the brake drum earlier. Okay. Um, just talking about how it's used as a, it, the, the timbral mimetic aspect of uh, recreating an anvil sound. Um, versus all just being you know uh, used by the early percussion works of uh, cowl and, and cage and, and sort of evoking other uh, East Asian sound sound concepts um, and but also exactly as you said I, I referenced the the break drum as a as the the kinetic force of, of the steel uh, ensemble and so t I'm more or less thinking about objects that were not originally designed for a musical intention, and then the moment that they they are you know utilized or employed in that fashion, then then it, it takes on a broader meaning. But I guess speaking to some of what we were talking about with organology, um, the classification could still be like this is a, an idiophone or something because of you know some of the 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 basic playing techniques still fall under those those generic categories. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah or, or like, do you think that that could like change over time? Like, do you think that any of these found objects, if they became used so widely that they were, you know, staples, I guess? Like, I'm not, I'm not looking, I'm not using the right word, but. No, I, I, I pose it in, the, I pose that question, too. Um, I, I said that, you know, because the break drum is more widely used in orchestras and everything than, than uh, a cactus, does that mean that it's, it's graduated from objecthood into to instrumentarium? And I, I kind of realized that, that at the current moment, I don't think that's the right question to answer. Or the right, yeah, the right question that we, that we should be asking. Um, if we're to truly level the, the playing field, so to speak, and to not create some sort of hierarchy or aristocracy of the timpani and the marimba versus the tin can and the break drum, then we can't afford to, um, to be so segmented um, and with, with our classification of everything. Yeah. I suppose, you know, the, the, this, mo this model of like, you know, um, uh, uh, manipulation of sound, it could, it, you know, it extends to, you know, other traditional pieces as well. I think of Stuart Saunders Smith's *The Noble Snare* and the collection of, of uh, snare pieces, and that every one of those pieces asks performers to think of the snare drum as a totally as, as an object, 
and a totally unique um, instrument and beyond the inherent sound qualities that we're so used to, to, to teaching our undergrad students. So by no means to, is this model you know, strictly limited to, to found objects or percussion or any, anything of, of that. Um, this has really just been uh, a mental exercise for trying to, to prevent us from constantly going back and forth and interchangeably using terms like found objects and junk percussion and stuff like that. I don't think that's changing anytime soon, um, but I still felt like it was a, a, a worthy endeavor. Sorry, we ran out of time. Great. I do want to nudge you to talk about one thing we've just hinted at here, but you've talked about more elsewhere over the last five years. Um, you hinted at the way in which some of these pieces can help to generate conversations around climate change and environmentalism and those sorts of things. Can you talk more about this repertoire broadly and the way in which, especially you've used that to help have some of those conversations? Yeah. Um, thank you. I can always I can always count on you to give me give me the real hard questions at the very end. Um, um, a, a lot of uh, yeah, a lot of my research and and a lot of the the pieces I'm sort of drawn to naturally are pieces that use objects that that um, have a sort of climate narrative to them. Um, the certainly the first two pieces, or excuse me, the ice and, and cages piece, um, have you know rather overt references. Um, if not easily, um, you could easily you know draw your own conclusions or interpretations from them. But I I would say that you could make the same argument with the, all these other pieces, looking at it perhaps more from like uh, an anti-consumerism or anti-capitalism lens and. And so in some ways, they're, they're all two sides of the same coin. Um, but there was a second question. How you've used those pieces to start having some of those conversations, particularly with your non-music specialist audiences? So I'm thinking of the Bertner research and the master's thesis. The Bertner research, so it, he's referencing my, my master's thesis, which was on the music of Matthew Bertner and John Luther Adams, and how their, their compositional practice changed over time. Um, for those of you that don't know, they both spent large portions of their lives living in um, Alaska. And while they no longer live in Alaska, they're, they're largely influenced by climate change. And it's, it's dramatically um, shaped the, the style of compositions from pieces that more or less sort of celebrate and showcase here are all the wonderful natural sounds of the world, or in the, in the case of, of um, you know, Vivian Funk's piece, showing us on a, on a really accelerated level that the human manipulation is a very real, significant, dramatic consequence of, of how we, we treat the natural world. Um, and and Bertner, Matthew Berner has also written a number of pieces like this for you know, um, playing uh, on amplified snow and glockenspiel. Um, and he'll use a, almost every piece has some sort of granular synthesized backing track to go along with it. And what he often does with this granular synthesis is he'll take data um, from, from climate sources and sonify, or in other words, turn these sort of numbers into a musical sound. And that then provides the, the backing track for some of these pieces. One piece that comes to mind is uh, Ice Prince for piano, where he sort of takes the levels of, um, uh, of ice decay in a certain uh, portion of Alaska and sort of uh, turns that into a tape while the pianist starts at the very beginning from the very highest register of the instrument and by the end of the piece they're playing in the lowest register of the piece. Um, I'm sure we're about, I, sorry, I didn't mean to vamp there. No, um, no, that's, that's great. We are out of time. Though, yeah. So um, let's thank Luke and please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.